All right. So uh, first off, thank you for coming to learn about monarchs. Um, my name is Amy Miller. I have a website called The Monarch Project. And uh, I go around teaching people about monarchs and what you can do to help save this um, magnificent little creature uh, and the incredible phenomena of its migration, which is really, uh, when we talk about trying to, quote, save the monarch, what, that's what we're really talking about. Because the monarch does something that no other creature in the world does. And that is it makes this incredible migration in the fall to Mexico. It goes to a place it has never been and will never return. So how does it know where to go? And the place that it goes is a little teeny piece of Mexico, near Mexico City, uh, that's only about, uh, I might be wrong, but I think like 15 miles square. So this little teeny creature flies anywhere between 2,500 and 3,000 miles to a place that it's never been and will never return. And we still don't know exactly how it does this. So there are lots of things that are going on regarding the monarchs and why their decline. Um, and I'm not going to lecture on all the bad things that we do <laughs> to poor Mother Nature. Um, instead, I think that um, Jacques Cousteau had a great quote, uh, we protect the things we love. So what I do instead is try to get people to appreciate these little creatures and what you can do for them. And that way, perhaps, we can grow our gardens and tell other people about um, monarchs and what you can do rather than place blame on everybody. Um, but there are a couple things that we will talk about um, that you can do. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go uh, talk a little bit about the monarch and the monarch life cycle, which is actually rather interesting. Um, so the first, we'll call the first pair of monarchs, mom and pop. So they're the monarchs that are down in Mexico, hanging out in Mexico over the winter and enjoying themselves. They basically um, migrate to these uh, uh, volcanic forests that are um, filled with oyamel trees, which are kind of a fir tree. It's easy for them to hang on to these needles with their little teeny feet. And uh, they kind of go into almost a state of hibernation, not exactly, but kind of. Monarchs cannot fly when the temperature is below 55 degrees. So this part of Mexico is a perfect climate for them to slow their metabolism down and kind of hang out in this area where they're fairly protected um, and winter over. So about March, uh, as it starts to warm up and they decide it's time to head north, and they will fly out of Mexico, and they will get to uh, the southern states, Texas generally, Louisiana, someplace down in there. And those, mo and mom and pop, will lay the first eggs. Now those eggs will take about three to five days to turn into, or to hatch and turn into a caterpillar. And then the caterpillar will live about, uh, it will take about 10 days, 10 to 14 days, for the caterpillar to grow to the point of being able to um, get ready to pupate. And it will then uh, actually hang in a J, like this little guy. Um, and then it will turn into, it will pupate into a chrysalis. And it's a chrysalis, it's not a cocoon. Cocoons are moths, chrysalis are butterflies. So it will turn into a chrysalis. And again, I'll show you some of these. You can hang, see some of them hanging in here. It'll be in that stage for about 10 to 14 days. This is indicative of the temperature generally. If it's warmer, it might speed up the process. If it's cooler, it might slow it down a little bit. But it'll take about two weeks for them to be in this stage. And then they will eclose or emerge from their chrysalis. And they will have to hang like this little guy in here, or I should say gal, because that's a girl. Uh, she'll have to hang like that for about three to four hours while she lets her wings dry uh, and then she will be able to fly. So now she will be the first generation. She's the first eggs that are laid for Mexico. Now she's going to make a trek, or not her, the first generation that came up from um, Texas. Um, so she'll be the, she's going to be the second generation. Now she is, um, the ones from Texas though, uh, when they mature, they then fly up into our neck of the woods. 
and they will continue to fly south up into even Canada to the, some of the lower areas of Canada. Anywhere where milkweed grows because milkweed is the only plant that the monarch caterpillar lays its eggs on and it's the only plant that the monarch caterpillar eats and that's very very important to understand. People think of milkweed as a weed after all, it's got weed in the name, you know, and they yank it out of their gardens and they don't realize how important milkweed is to the monarchs because, like I said, it's the only thing they lay their eggs on, it's the only thing they eat. So wherever it grows uh, along, um, especially the I-35 corridor, which is kind of the, one of the flyaway zones up into Canada, um, anywhere there's milkweed growing, you could find monarchs there. Also into uh, some of the, the east coast area, but we're right in the hardcore zone of monarchs. Yay! So uh, anyway, so that first, um, th that generation that comes up, uh, the, the adults that come up from, from Texas, they lay their eggs up here. Uh, they usually show up about the beginning of June, in, I mean the beginning of uh, May in our area. Um, let's see, am I got that right? Um, uh, June, uh, no, June, beginning of June. Uh, and so then those monarchs that are coming up from Texas, they're kind of beat, beat up and they're you know, tired and they're looking for uh, milkweed to lay eggs on. And so we'll get a bunch of eggs right about that time. And then they're gonna have to go through that cycle again of you know, egg, caterpillar. And it takes about 30 days uh, for them to go from the egg stage to um, the adult stage. So this is the daughter of one of the Texans. And now she is going to lay eggs up here. And basically, um, she's not gonna go any farther. She's not gonna migrate farther north. She's gonna pretty much stay in the area where she was, the egg was laid and continue to repopulate the monarchs in that area. And she will lay the uh, next, the third generation and then uh, there'll be a fourth generation. Now the first, second, and third generations, they're basically four every year. Um, the first, second, and third generation, they are responsible for repopulating all the monarchs basically east of the Rockies in the US. So they're, all they got on their little butterfly minds is let's make lots of monarchs. So their job is to drink a lot of nectar from uh, nectar plants, from flowers, uh, do a lot of mating and laying a lot of eggs and producing a, lot of, a whole bunch of monarchs. Because of that, they only live about four to six weeks. But that fourth generation, and this is the generation that's going to be, will eclose in August. It generally eclosis or emerges um, right around the middle of August. And they're what we call the super monarchs. These are the monarchs that are going to be making the migration to Mexico. And they are actually, they eclose in what's called a state of diapause, which means that their sex organs are not developed because they can't be bothered with that. I gotta fly 2,500 miles. I can't think about, you know, mating and laying eggs. I have another job. Because of that, because they are in a, in a state of diapause, they will live about eight months because they make this flight down to Mexico, again to this place they've never been before and will never return. They go into this kind of hibernative state and then um, when March happens and it warms up, then they fully develop and then they start thinking about having monarchs and then it, the clock starts ticking because once they fully develop, then they're only gonna live a few more weeks after that. So they live anywhere between seven, eight months. So they're really very special. Um, and so that's kind of the, the basic life cycle of the monarchs. Now, I'm gonna show you the egg. Um, and I'll, I'll bring this around. Actually, I'll pass it around so you can see it. But you'll notice, and I'll just kind of show you, You'll notice these three here, you'll see this little teeny dot. That is a monarch egg. It's very, very tiny. Some people will tell you, and I'll, I'll pass, uh, pass it around so you can pass, uh, look inside. Some people will tell you that they only lay eggs on the bottom of the leaves. Wrongo! 
I have two in here where they're on the top. So if you look real closely on these two little guys, you'll notice that there's an egg on the top of the leaf in there. So they'll lay it wherever they want. The one thing that I have found in collecting eggs is that a female will have kind of a idiosyncrasy, if you want. She's, a female may have a certain way she wants to lay eggs. So if I find an egg in a certain position on a milkweed, generally I will kind of look around and I'll go, if I was a monarch, which milkweed plant would I lay my egg on? And kind of check it out and look in the same area. Because often she will go lay an egg in the same area. And you'll kind of notice that on these three, this was probably the same female. These two where it's inside were probably the same female. Um, monarchs generally only lay one egg per milkweed. Um, that is to allow that uh, caterpillar to have plenty of food and not have to worry about competition. Um, in dire needs, if the milkweed is scarce or the monarch is really towards the end of her cycle, she may lay multiple eggs on that. But when I do captive mating and breed um, monarchs in a cage, um, I have to supply fresh milkweed for her to lay her eggs on and it takes effort because I have to keep putting her on the milkweed because she's like, I, I need another milkweed. It's like, no, you got to deal with this one, you know, lay all your eggs on here. And they do eventually do it because they want to get rid of the eggs, but that's not preferable. They want to lay an egg on a different milkweed. So you can look in here. You'll also notice a couple stages of young babies that have um, come out. So there's one in here and, and there's a couple that are a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm just going to let you pass that around and you can kind of look at it. I also will point out that there is this single leaf that's in here and it has a little dot on it that looks a lot like an egg, but it's not. It's actually a latex bubble. So I put this in here so you can see how close it resembles the egg mm -hmm. and how uh, deceiving it can be when you start looking for eggs. Um, once you start to, a lot of times the eggs, especially as the season grow, gets later, the eggs will be on the lower leaves of a plant. But at this time of the year, I usually look in the upper parts where it's more, they're more tender. Because when the babies come out, um, they have to be very careful that they don't puncture a vein in that leaf, or it's like a tsunami of milkweed. And it'll take out this poor little you know, caterpillar who is extremely tiny. Um, so you have to be, like I said, they have to be a little bit careful. And you'll, sometimes when you're looking for eggs or, or for new hatches, what you'll see is you'll see a little nibble that's kind of in the shape of a C. And that's because he's nibbling all the little area around him to keep the tsunami from coming. Um, and that's sometimes a way that you can kind of spot an egg or a newly hatched caterpillar in there. So these are, the little guys in there are probably only um, a few days old. Um, it will take, like I said, it'll take them about 10 days. And I'll hand that over there so you can see. And again, here's the outer ones, and then there's the inner ones, and then there's some uh -huh. babies. There's a little guy, uh -huh. and then there's the latex bubble. Uh -huh. um, you can see that they're starting to get larger. It'll take them, like I said, about 10 days. Come here, dude. And then they will get to be about this big. Now this little guy is probably, when they get to this stage, they eat a ton, a ton. <laughs> when I've got Bo several boxes like this, it becomes literally a full-time job. I go out, I've got 27 acres full of milkweed. I take a bucket, I go out there, I harvest milkweeds that are this big, shove my bucket till it's about this big. I do it twice a day. And I do it, and then I clean them, the cages. Because eating causes something else to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we call it frass. So you'll notice a little caterpillar poops in the box. That's called frass. Call You're it something nice. He's gonna fall off. No, no. I usually don't let him crawl on people though because uh, if you have lotion or insecticide or something, I, I had that happen with an event where a little girl wanted him to crawl on her arm and I don't know what was on it, but something toxic. And so I stopped letting people do that. But I will let you kind of look at this guy. And so he, he's getting pretty close to being ready to pupate. 
And I think that one of the things that makes monarchs endearing to people is that their larva, what a horrible word, I guess, unless you're a scientist, but most people like the word caterpillar better. I like caterpillar better. Um, but larva is, the, is also a correct term. They're cute. They are. Um, yeah. I love fireflies. I think they're just the coolest things. And dragonflies, too. Their larvas are horrible. They're <laughs> but hey, they produce cool bugs. So anyway, so that's the, that's the adult. So you can kind of see the adult. Back end looks like it's fronted. Very similar, except he has the um, tentacles, which are long. And that's actually kind of how you determine the age. Um, now, they have to go through different stages. It's kind of, they're kind of like a snake, whereas their skin is not supple like ours. So they, they have to shed their skin like a snake each time they grow. And they will do this five times. And each time they change, it go, they, it's referred to as a um, instar. And so they'll go through these, these five instar stages. And they'll shed their skin. And they'll usually go someplace. And sometimes they'll tuck themselves in a, a leaf or they'll crawl under something to shed their skin. So you can kind of see egg, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. By the time, and you can pass that around too. By the time they get to the fifth instar, they have grown about 3,000 times the size they initially were. And I like to tell kids that if you were to eat as much in those two weeks that it takes for the caterpillar to get from the egg stage to the chrysalis stage, you would be the size of a bus, a school bus. So, I mean, that kind of helps you figure out just how much these guys grow. So once they get to the pupa stage, now they're going to hang in a J. And I'll, I'll walk around so you can see this. But the J, what he, what he does is they have a spinet, like a spider, and they will spin this webbing. And so you'll see this little cotton button right here on the tip. He will spin this little cotton button, and then what he's going to do, and you can see the little guy hanging in a J, mm -hmm. he will skin the, he'll do this little button, and then he's going to take his two back pro legs, and he's going to shove them up into this little button right here. And then when he's ready to, pu to um, pupate, so you can see the little button. When he's ready to pupate, and you can see the, little, the guy in the J, he actually, He's like, come on, let me go. Sorry, guy. He had a really rocky r ride on the way over here. Highway 10 is kind of bumpy. Um, yeah, he's, he's hanging on there. So what he's going to do is when he goes to pupate, and like I said, if we're lucky before everybody leaves today, maybe he'll actually pupate. Um, when he goes to pupate, there's a little like stem inside of him, and it's called a cremaster. He's going to shove that into that little cotton dot. And it's almost like it has little Velcro hooks in it. It's going to stick really hard up in there. And that will secure the chrysalis. And so the chrysalis will be um, much more stable. And so once he does that, or once he, he gets in the J, and he'll hang in the J for about 18 hours, then what he's going to do is his skin will split for the last time, and he's going to shed this skin. And it will shrink up till it's this little wad of skin on the top. And you'll, you can actually see here's a little skin right at the top here. Um, and he's going to be this big green gooey blob. And then that cream master gets stuck into that button there. And he'll do this little pupa dance where he just does this. And what he's doing is he's wiggling until he gets that skin to fall off because he doesn't want that to interfere with the formation of the chrysalis. So you've got this big green gooey blob, and it's very, very vulnerable, very fragile. And it will take about eight hours for it to kind of shrink and shrivel up until it forms the chrysalis. And so you can come and look at the chrysalis at some point whenever you want. I'm not going to move the cage around, but um, they're absolutely beautiful. The chrysalis are like these little jewels. And here you can see the cream master. Now again, I'll pass it around. You can see the little stem. Uh, the 
nobody really knows why they have the gold on them. And it's, it, if you look closely, you can see this beautiful iridescence on them. It's what they believe um, lent to monarchs being named monarchs because of the gold, but we really don't know why it's there. It's just kind of nature's little decorative ornamentation on the monarchs. Um, so once the, uh, the caterpillar has pupated into this chrysalis, um, again, it'll be in that stage for about 10 days. And the last thing to form on the monarch is the pigmentation inside. So actually, when you look at a green chrysalis, like in that photo, what you're seeing, the chrysalis is clear. What you're seeing is that green gooey blob. And if you actually look closely at it, you can actually see that it has everything it needs pretty much to be a monarch at that point. It just has to complete the metamorphosis. It's really quite an amazing thing. Um, but what, what will happen is the night before, the pigmentation will start to form. And that's what you're seeing here, the dark ones. And if you look at them, you can actually see the monarch inside of it. So this is, like I said, you can see the chrysalis is clear. And you can see the actual little formation of the monarch inside of it. And so then what will happen is usually, usually in the morning, but again, because of the cool and the gray, um, these guys are a little bit behind. Um, and you can also see that a couple of the other ones in here are starting to get dark. They're going to come out tomorrow. Um, otherwise, they're usually that kind of that beautiful green that we, I showed you in the picture. Excuse me. Do they, are they on the milkweed plant or they could be on any? They could be a lot of different places. Um, they are very camouflaged and it's hard to find them in the wild. I have found two which I think is miraculous. And actually both times I have found them on milkweed, which is unusual because most of the time it's been told that they don't stay on the milkweed. They will climb up a tree or I've found, you know, chrysalis that have opened that have been like on the eve of a, a I found one in my garage jam, the door jam. I found one on a cabinet in a shed. You wonder where, how do they even know where to go? They just take off. And actually these guys can move pretty, pretty fast when there's this big. Um, but uh, they, they usually go up someplace and kind of out of the way where they're protected. So what will happen is when they are ready to come out of the chrysalis, there are these little air holes in the chrysalis, they're little spherical. and what will happen is they'll suck in a bunch of air, like a balloon, and that will force pressure inside the chrysalis, and it will force the chrysalis to pop open. And when that happens, out will come the monarch. So you can kind of see him pushing it open and I'm hoping that this little guy, one of the two, will do that before everybody leaves today, if we're, in, if we're, we're lucky. Um, it's pretty miraculous. It only takes about two minutes for them to pupate and only takes about two minutes for them to come out of this. So the chances of you seeing this is kind of unusual, but I've been really lucky. A lot of times it happens at my lectures, so wow. let's hope today. Um, so anyway, so the, the, the monarch is going to come out and he's going to hang upside down. And the wings are all scrunched up and because they've been stuffed in this little chrysalis. So the, the monarch's going to grab onto the chrysalis and hang upside down and with gravity and by actually doing these little like stomach curls its abdomen is really big and fat. And you can see that in the picture, how fat the abdomen is when it first comes out and its wings are really tiny. So by hanging upside down, what it's going to do is it's going to use gravity in its favor, and then it's going to do these little ab curls where you can actually watch it happen. It's doing this thing, and it's pumping the fluid through the veins in its wings until the wings straighten out. And then it looks like this. And it will be in that state for, like I said, about four hours. Because when the wings come out, they're very wet and fragile, like wet tissue paper. And so it will take them, um, like I said, about four hours for them to harden. And then they'll be able to fly. So, uh, so we're going to put the lid back on this guy. So that kind of shows you a little bit about just the monarch um, Again, the cycle and the stages that I have in here, and you're welcome to come and check out 
any of these stages. I talked a little bit about the migration, which I, like I said, is very, very important to the monarch butterfly. Um, if we do lose the migration, it's not like we're gonna lose all the monarchs in the world because there are monarchs in other parts of the world, but that's not the point. The point is that this creature does something really, truly unique. And so it's kind of uh, important for us to at least try to keep that from going away. Um, again, milkweed is one of the big things. So I've brought, many of you may be familiar with milkweed, but this is the typical pod. I'm not gonna open it up or it'll blow all over here. Um, they are, this is the milkweed pod, the milkweed seeds. Um, this is common milkweed. Uh, common milkweed is um, a little bit more invasive. If you have ever smelled it, it's the most heavenly thing in the whole world, I think. So it has these great big, right now you'll, you'll start seeing it in the ditches. You got some in the yard? Yes, it's out in the back. Oh, we can go and look at that, you know, um, afterwards. Um, but it gets these pom-poms, these pink pom-poms that are so fragrant, it will just fill your whole yard. Um, but it is a little bit invasive. Um, it is one of the more preferable milkweeds that monarchs like. Um, this is swamp milkweed or red milkweed. It's fairly um, easy to find in nurseries. Uh, greenhouse nurseries. It's also a native milkweed, which is, that's the thing. If you're going to do a garden, you want to plant native um, species when possible for two reasons. One, you want to plant the native species of milkweed um, in your area because you want it to grow. Um, this one is a little less invasive. And there's also the orange butterfly weed, which people will find in the garden centers. That one, um, if you can get it to grow in your area, is great. Um, but it can be hard to grow because it likes a very sandy, dry area. No, no, Joe Pie is a good nectar plant, but it is not a host plant. Okay. So you've got to deal with milkweeds, and I do have some great literature here that you can look at as far as milkweeds and gardening and all that. But these are the two different um, milkweeds that are common in our area and e very easy to grow in your garden, so that's something to think about. I also have um, a great list of I did a, uh, the Ludu Mansion, we converted a rain garden, two rain gar gardens down there into, um, oh, he's coming out, he's coming out. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. So you can see, okay, we missed him coming out. Like I said, it happens very fast, but you can see the fat abdomen and you can see the scrunchy wings. So, <laughs> so it'll take him, it won't take too long, but uh, uh, again, you'll be amazed at how fast those wings will stretch out. I don't remember seeing two and then all of a sudden there's like another one coming out. Of the Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, it happens so fast that, you know, but it's so cool to be able to see it. And a lot of times I have them in my, my cages like this, but this guy was Jane and I wanted to make sure I got him here, so I decided to bring the, this cage, which is a little harder to see, but you can still see. Yeah. And maybe this guy will come out too, then, you know, although that one was really rocking and rolling on the way in today, so I think he was probably, oh, my head. <laughs> I need to just settle for a minute and, you know. So, um, anyway, there are some great uh, native plants here that you can look at. I have native garden lists. Um, another fun thing that you can do is you can get yourself registered as part of the Monarch Way Stations. Um, this is a very simple thing that you can do. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that, yes, you do need milkweed, but nectar plants are equally as important because during the breeding season, there has to be food for monarchs. And when they are a caterpillar, when they're a caterpillar, they have mandibles so that you can see how they chew through these leaves and they, they eat the leaves. But once they become a monarch, they have a proboscis. So they have this long, skinny tongue. And now they are no longer eating solid milkweed. They are dependent upon the nectar from nectar plants. So here you can see his proboscis. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention about n nectar or native plants versus you know, a lot of commercial plants in your nurseries. Um, a lot of, when you start looking at, let's take Monarda or bee balm, for instance. Native Monarda is a very good nectar plant for um, monarchs. Um, but if you go to any garden center, you will see all these fancy hybridized versions of Monardas, big double flowers, super bright colors. Um, when they start to do that, a lot of times they breed 
out the nectar qualities of a plant in order for showiness. So the closer you can stay to a native plant, the better nectar source it would be. Now I'm not saying you have to have every single plant in your garden a native plant, but just bear that in mind so that you do have some natives or at least good nectar plants. Some of the uh, hybridized ones are not quite as um, bred out or, or are still good nectar plants, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, also, uh, they like purple, orange, and red um, better than white. Yellow is okay too, um, but they like those colors. You want to plant your, your plants in chunks of color rather than one here, one there, one, one, one. Um, because they'll be drawn to a patch of color. You want to try to have uh, at least three different things blooming through each cycle. So three things you know, in June, three things in July, three things in August that are blooming so that there's a variety of, of uh, nectar plants. And if you are only gonna put one plant in your garden, uh, please look into the blazing stars. Um, Leatris is the botanical name, the meadow, Blazing Star is a surefire magnet for monarchs in your garden in the fall. Um, but one thing you have to be careful of is, and so are the New, the New England asters, if you cut them back before, uh, let's see, June 15th, you may cut back all the blooms and they won't bloom in the fall. It's one of the problems we have with the mowing that goes on around roadsides, is that they mow, they try to you know figure out a time to mow, but they actually will cut out the nectar plants for fall blooming, and that can be a bit of an issue. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, let's see if there's, the, the way station I did want to mention though also, uh, this is a very easy thing to do. You can go to Monarch Watch, um, this website. It asks you questions about, it asks you questions about the, um, your garden. It doesn't have to be a big garden. This garden out here would probably qualify. Um, you check off the checklist that says, you know, do you use pesticides, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then for about, I think it's about $32, $33, something like that, you can actually register your garden and they'll send you a sign that you can put saying that you have a way station. So that's kind of a cool thing to do. You'll see these all over the Twin Cities, down by the lakes. There's lots of Monarch way stations tucked around in that. Um, so that kind of gives you some idea of the Monarchs. Um, here are some chrysalis. There's a few extra things you can look up, up up here. I always like to show these to the kids. Oh, I should have showed this to the kids. I'm sorry I got caught up with the adults. So this is some of my chrysalis from last year. I have a tendency to wind them around. But you can see that they're clear. And they're very fragile. But I'll just keep that here so you can check it out if you want. And also there is... Uh, Oh, I will t ask, tell you one more thing about the male and the female. There's a little um, reeker box here that has some of the stages of the, the monarch in here. These two little dots here, those are the little masks that come off when they shed their skin. And so it's like you find these little smiley faces in the box. Those are actually their little faces that, that they shed. And I will just mention this one last thing. So how many people think this is a monarch? That is not. That is not. You guys are so bright. <laughs> Wise. Thank you. This is a viceroy. Looks like a monarch, but it has this line that goes through. And so this is a viceroy. They kind of play off the whole orange uh, coloring of the monarch, which signifies to things like birds that I eat milkweed, milkweed is poisonous, you're going to throw up if you eat me. Um, and even though this doesn't eat the milkweed, it still gets to have that warning signal. Uh, here are two different monarchs. One is a male, one is a female. The male has these little spots on the bottom of it. They're called alar, spot, alar spots. And that kind of is basically the real difference between them. They also have little pinchers on the end of their abdomen um, for grasping the female when they are mating. So you can look at these. I actually have two of them up here that are mounted that you can look at as well. And there, this is an interesting life cycle poster that you are welcome to look at. 
and uh, so you can kind of see the different stages of it and the cycle period as well. Uh, and there's also a little information on the migrations if you want to check this out. And there's all the um, garden literature and this is a great booklet on protecting monarchs. Um, besides the gardening, uh, creating a garden for habitat, preserving the habitat, um, mowing practices are the other thing that is something that everybody can do, especially out here in the rural country where even just scaling back 10%. Um, it's, it's something that I kind of, I try to understand a little bit with the mentality. Uh, farmers, especially the older farmers, you know, in order to be a good farmer, quote, you had to have everything mowed so people could see your big, beautiful, neat farm, even if it meant the ditches were like this. If you can convince some of these people to just mow everything, that's fine, but don't mow your ditch. Just, it's hazardous to your health anyway. <laughs> you know, if you can just, if we can work at some of that, mowing the right, right of ways, um, if we can get some of that to not be mowed, or if these areas do need to be mowed, if they can just wait until after October 1st, or even better yet, October 15th, by then, everybody's gone. So there's little things like that that you can do. I do have a, a Let It Grow pamphlet here that talks about that, about trying to help, um, you know, spreading the word about mowing practices with your community, with whoever the guy is that mows your Prescott, you know, those kind of things. If you can talk to people, uh, talk to people about gardens, just talk to people about leaving the milkweed in their garden. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Otherwise, yes. Are these materials and images on your website? Uh, I have a lot of links, yes, on my website. And the website is monarchprojects.com. So it's monarchprojects with a S, dot com. Um, lots of links to all sorts of great information, um, as well as just a lot of general information on just monarchs as well. So, Have you or anyone here had any discussions about the fact that regarding mowing, right now it seems like we have an explosion of wild parsnip. Oh, yes. And you want to try to make that not set seed. Right, so you want to mow it, yeah. You want to mow that before it sets seed. Right. And in there, there's also milkweed. So do you have any thoughts on You know, I, I, I actually have to say, I was thinking about that right now. You know, I mean, there are going to be times when we have to do something we don't want to do, use Roundup, whatever, you know. With pesticides and stuff like that, the key is, can you use them as a spot? instead of blasting. Um, the, one of the, the talking points about mowing practices is can you mow this chunk and leave this chunk and then you know, mow this chunk after this one grows or whatever, you know what I mean? Can you do it in chunks so that you've got um, diversity, you've got these areas and you're not just wiping everything out. The parsnip is a problem and um, if, if you have to mow it or round up it, that's, you know, because I'm dealing with that on my property right now too. Um, there is a woman um, that has, uh, I think she's up in St. Croix, that has restored this huge chunk of land and she goes out and she weeds it out. She pulls it. It's like, I don't know what, what else you have to do in your day, but <laughs> that's a lot of work. So there are things that you can do like that, but you know, just just cutting it and not having to go to seed, is it just gonna come back again, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a catch-22. It's definitely a catch-22. Does that come from seed every year, or is that come no, from root? No, I'm not 100% sure, and that would be a good thing for me to find out. Because now there's a, there, there are relatives like um, um, the Golden Alexander, which looks very similar to it, which is a perennial. So, you know, it's something to, I, I'm not, I'm, it's something I will be checking out because I'm going to have to deal with it for the first time. It, it's really bad on it my property. Like this year it went crazy. This year as ever before. Yeah, I agree. And I agree. And inside there, there's milkweed. So yep. And, you know, so it, like I said, it's, it's a real catch-22. Um, sometimes you... 
sometimes you know you might find that you've just got to blast that and try to get rid of, rid of that wild parsnip because it's it's so toxic yeah, it's you know so if it was just a weed it wouldn't be a big deal but it's a phototoxic weed that causes blistering and and it's an issue so you know sometimes you've got to deal with that um, you might be able to blast it and and then try to reseed with milkweed again um, if it does take off the milkweed um, you can try mowing it and see you know, what, what that happens. With, the, with croplands, the problem with the GMOs and the neonicotinoids is that um, milkweed was in lots and lots of egg fields and the monarchs were very dependent upon it in egg fields. I mean that's where it came from, like 75% of it came from egg fields. Um, but with the development of GMO and they can blast the fields with Roundup, the milkweed can't take that. It could take tilling, the old-fashioned weed control. Mm -hmm. Milkweed could handle that. But once they went in and started blasting with Roundup, um, the milkweed can't. And that's one of the reasons that we've lost so much habitat is from egg development and, you know, people building houses, building buildings, you know, and they're taking out. Prescott, great example. I look at, at um, all the commercial stuff going up out there, and I even had a talk with Patax. Can't you just let your Can't you just let it grow along your ditches? You know, I mean, you can mow around the building if you want, but people are reluctant. They have this thing about it, everything has to be neat and tidy, and uh, it doesn't really have to all be neat and tidy. That's the other thing too about your gardens is that if you're planting things for host plants, for butterflies and caterpillars. They're going to eat your gardens, so <laughs> keep that in mind. You get a few, you know, nibble marks on plants. And it's okay because you're you're creating cool bugs. So, anybody else? All right, we'll come up and look. And anything you wish to check out, feel free to or ask any questions if you want. They can go out and look at the milkweed. Oh yeah, we can go. Beautiful, it's huge. Yeah, it is out there. The milkweed's done pretty well this year. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know that they've been keeping it there for quite a while. Yeah, they bought a bunch of the native yeah. plants. I, uh, I'm not doing the, <laughs> I had a whole na native garden that was nursery garden and I was selling all these native plants and it was a lot of work. So I'm not uh, doing that as much. Uh, have you worked with the native plants uh, north of River Falls? On Kinney, Kinney, Kinney Kinnick, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, I did. Yeah, they have a lot out there. They have a good, yeah, I, I actually worked with them for a while and uh, did a bunch of transplanting and stuff with them and learned a lot and it was actually uh, right after that that I started doing my own native nursery which I really enjoyed doing um, but it well one my husband was kind of irritated <laughs> by me taking up all this place all this property for my native nursery um, and it was a lot of work to maintain it um, and then try to get rid of the plants as well but um, I did learn a lot and so Kinney is a good place to get plants. Okay. Yeah, good place to get plants. I was going to ask you, so if a field is sprayed and there's milkweed in the ditch, obviously I would guess there would be some overspray. A lot of times there will be. So does the monarch still eat that milkweed or does is the milkweed some way... If, if the milkweed dies, uh, then the, mil the monarch's not going to eat it. If, if, and here's the deal with the neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are a systemic um, insecticide. And so what happens is it gets into the plant. And it's not just the leaves, but it's also into the nectar. And this is why there's the issue with the bees and the neonicotinoid use. Um, so, and the other problem with the, with the neonicotinoids is that we don't know how long they stay in the ground. So. Uh, you could try to reclaim, say, a crop field that had been using neonicotinoids, and it may still come up in the milkweed that grows in that field just because it's still in the soil. And we're still trying to figure out how long it will take for all of that to, you know, work its way out of the soil. So it, it's, it's a real concern, and it's hard to find um, plants that have not been treated by neonicotinoids. So. Ask your, ask your nurseries and, and that. Um, Gertens actually does not use them, so. Um, some places do, but beware of places like Home Depot and Menards and those big box stores that sell plants because most of those, um, a lot of them are coming from um, treated plants, you know, because that's the cheaper, easier, faster way to grow things. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as the, you know, you get an overspray, um, the adults, 
can sometimes handle, like the monarchs might be able to handle the nectar a bit better, but the caterpillars won't be able to handle the toxic um, toxins in the milkweed, you know. So it's, it's best to try to avoid it if possible, but. Those ditches then could be cut. Possibly, yeah. You know, it, it, and the thing is, is if you've gotten Roundup into the, if, if the Roundup has hit the um, milkweed to the point of killing it, to the point of the monarch not being able to eat it, you're not going to have to worry because the milkweed's going to be dead. Um, and the neonicotinoids are generally applied to the seed as a coating. So they're not really spraying that like a Roundup. So, but you know. It will be in there just from the seed being sprayed? It'll be in the plant? Yeah, the seeds are coated with a, a neonicotinoid um, insecticide. And this has been a controversial thing because the, you know, the big seed companies like Monsanto and Bayer and these places don't even really allow the option to not buy <laughs> treated seed. Um, and so if you are a farmer and you want to get untreated seed, either it's very hard to get or it's very expensive. They don't want you to buy that. They want you to, and then there are farmers who actually treat the seed themselves. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done. And that's what I try to help, you know. I can't learn, I don't know everything about everything. Please, I, I know that. <laughs> There's a lot of questions I still have. Um, but starting and asking questions and seeing what you can learn is a start, you know. But, you know, if we could just try not to get treated seed. If that was just a little bit more available, maybe that would be a good starting point. And then maybe we would learn how long it stays in the in the ground as well, yeah. you know. So you got to start someplace. But um, like I said, there are things we can do. We can do our little gardens, you know. Kinney's a great place to get the native plants, um, and there are, you know, like I said, just kind of ask around when you're talking to um, garden centers about what do they use them. Do they know their sources? Kinney grows all their stuff from seed. I know because I worked with them. So there are no, no pesticides involved there. So that's a safe zone. Um, and their plants are healthy. A lot of times their plants are really rip bound. So um, go get them and get them in the ground. <laughs> yeah, nice people that own the place too. Yeah. And there are a lot of other n native nurseries. I mean, if you want to Google native nurseries, um, there's, there's a good drive, uh, let's see, what's it, uh, Prairie Restoration, I think they've got one up in, um, north in, um, up towards Taylor Falls or something. Yeah. Um, Are you familiar with them? What's the town? Uh, I've, I've, on St. Croix, the little yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. They have a native garden there that they're replanting all the trees and the grasses that you can walk through it. And they've got them all labeled and everything. Is that is that Prairie Restoration? You know, I can't remember. I mean, I, again, I, I'm thinking all I can think of is Schofield, yeah, and that's not the town. It's the little town. Five. It's um, yeah. Not St. Croix. Yeah, it's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got that garden in the right in the city limits. So when you're there, you can walk through it and see all the native things that they're trying to bring back. Yeah. And they've got them all labeled and stuff. And you and they they've got a pretty good selection, and you yeah. can buy a lot of a lot of their stuff is pretty small. Um, so you might want to pot it up and let it mature a little bit too. You know, sometimes I have found, at least in my gardening experiences, that if I pot it up and give it a little time to grow before I drop it in the ground, it stands a little bit better chance. So, you know, otherwise you've got to kind of keep an eye on it. And is it too late? In oh, season? no. It's not. No, you know, a lot of times they say perennials should be planted spring and fall. Um, but if you are taking care of them, and making sure that they're not, they're, they're getting the right water source. You don't want to overwater something that doesn't want that much water, and you know, but you don't want it to dry out. And they don't have very big root systems, so you have to kind of keep an eye on them. Um, but as long as you're keeping an eye on the plant, you know, you should be able to do okay by planting it. So my milkweeds that I bought are only about this big. Are, are they going to be chewed down by something else? Are rabbits going to eat them? Uh, bunnies, sometimes I've, I've had issues with my bunnies. I ended up putting cages around. I had a, a, a 
endangered milkweed called uh, Silvante, which I had gotten from this one um, native nursery. And I had I eked it along for two years, and darn if I didn't lose it all this spring for whatever reason. I don't know if it was just too wet or um, maybe that's why it's native <laughs> or endangered is that it's hard to grow. But, um, you know, it kind of depends, again, on the plant and what the plant requirements are. So, you know, your common milkweed is really adaptable. Goes a lot of, and, and is the, did you get common? Do you know, I or did you get the was, red? Uh, is it a spider milkweed, something? I don't know. It's got thinner, very thin leaves that come up. up. Then that's the, probably the red, okay. the redder swamp. Okay. And mm -hmm. then I got the Joe Pye weed, and then I, I have a couple of regular, just local milkweeds that I've dug up to move into this area. Now, um, one thing about trying to transplant milkweed, it has a very large taproot, and it's very hard to transplant. Is it really? Yeah. So if you if it dies on you, don't be surprised. Um, also, what will happen with common is it will it will do a host plant, so it's got the mommy plant, and then it will send out all the gametes or ramets. Oh. And so once you get a healthy plant, um, it will spread. And those are pretty easy to you know mow or pop out if if they're getting your garden. Um, the one thing that um, I have had an issue with uh, in the last year or two has been um, it's some kind of a bacterial wilt or something that is in the milkweed and what will happen is the leaves will start to get that yellow veining in them and, what, and then the other thing that will happen is they look fine, they look healthy, but rather than having one big nice stem, you'll have all these little ones and they're all with this yellow veined leaves. Those are sick plants and what happens is that a, a milkweed eating insect, any kind of a milkweed beetle or whatever, will eat from the sick plant and then go eat a good plant and transfers the bacteria. Yes, I know. <laughs> and so then what happens is that, it, you know, so in my gardens I've, I yank up all of that diseased looking milkweed. Um, I was working, I was doing a, a class at, with the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab who I've worked with quite a bit and um, we were doing this class and I was asking Karen Oberhauser who's, she's like the queen of monarch preservation at the University of Minnesota Lab and I said well you know can I just leave it? She's like nope, gotta get it out of there because you're just gonna spread it and I you know, thinking I'm smarter, um, left it, and what I did is I spread it. So I ended up yanking it all out, and now I'm waiting for good milkweed to come back in. Um, but it's one thing to kind of keep an eye out for. I mean, I can't, I've got 27 acres, I can't go out and rip all of it out. But in certain areas where I have my kind of close patches that I like to use for um, getting, you know, milkweed for my babies, those kind of patches I do kind of keep up. I will point out something that's going on with this guy right now. If you, I don't know if you can see him. I can see him. Um, but when they are doing this, their expansion of their wings, they do their little, I call it the Arnold Schwarzenegger impressionation. They'll flex their wings. So his wings will come out like this and then he'll relax. And then he'll flex his wings again. I just thought they were pumping air into their wings or pumping fluid into their... They're pumping the fluid from that fat abdomen oh, okay. through the veins into their wings. So that, yes, they are... It's not air. It's close. <laughs> but there, now you can see he's opened up again. You can kind of see it better from the back view because you can see his wings are... So, yeah. And now he just relaxed. So I'll just spin them and maybe you'll be able to see them do it again. Now these other guys that you have in there, they didn't, did you move them from someplace? Yeah, they were all, um, they all pupated on the, my box tops. And um, so I like to reclaim my boxes when I can. And uh, I want, like I said, this guy was Jane and I wanted to make sure I brought him, but I didn't want all these other chrysalises it, in the way uh, because I was putting these big guys in here and I wanted them to be able to create chrysalis. So I use dental floss to tie them off. It's a simple technique but you have to be very careful when you do it so you don't damage the chrysalis because the chrysalis are pretty fragile. So you tie it onto that stem thing you were talking about? Yeah. And then break it off? And well, uh, again you've got that all this webbing yeah. and so um, I'll tie it 
uh, to the cream master and then I'll pull it a little bit and it will pull some of that webbing down and then I'll w take the webbing and spin it around the dental floss so that it's attached and you can kind of see that you'll see the little webbing kind of spun around the tip where the cream master is um, and then I hang them and I used to hang them on branches like this on my kitchen table because it was beautiful and then I just would put um, towels underneath it when they would start to eclose because they will drip whatever's left of their um, fluid and then I got this kitten <laughs> who is a moth eater <laughs> and he thought they were the greatest things in the world and so no more beautiful chrysalis on my kitchen table now they have to go into cages and out of the way because Thaddeus thinks they're fabulous so but yeah it, th this is just a way to, to reclaim the boxes and one other thing I will mention about rearing um, I encourage everybody to rear a monarch or two it's just such an amazing thing to watch if you think you're going to raise a thousand of them and save the monarchs you're sadly mistaken because monarchs are solo creatures they're not used to being colonized and kept in cages like this and so you have to be very diligent about bleaching and sanitizing your boxes and not having too many in and I cannot stress that enough because um, they're very susceptible to disease from each other because they are not like a bee living in a colony and I, I learned this um, firsthand two years ago when um, I got what's called black death which is a, a viral or bacterial disease you don't know where it comes from um, it could have come in on milkweed that I brought in it could have come from a caterpillar who had already been infected you don't know you have it there's no signs of it until your caterpillars start to liquefy which is horrible because you love these things and then you've got and it's extremely contagious and before you know you know it you have contaminated another box and another box and another box so it's very very important if you're going to rear um, caterpillars um, I, I read it in an article last year if you're rearing more than a hundred you're probably doing more damage than good um, I'm very diligent like I said I work with the monarch lab um, I have my caterpillars tested before I do captive matings and that um, but even that I have still really scaled down uh, because you start releasing um, monarchs unhealthy monarchs into the native colonies and then they spread problems so now we focus more on promoting the garden habitat and that but I do encourage people I mean you got a grandkid raise them they're so much fun you know and they're so beautiful um, but don't plan on you know I've raised seven eight hundred in a year and uh, I was very fortunate that most of you know throughout that year maybe I would lose 20 has pretty good rate um, a monarch caterpillar egg in the wild will be lucky to reach adulthood I think the percentage is something like 1% of 1% it's why mil females will lay about 500 eggs in the wild because everything eats them and it's not like the caterpillars can really run you know if somebody wants to eat that thing it's so one female monarch lays 500 eggs, which means she's got to find 500 plants, milkweed plants that another female didn't find? Well, she, you know, they will lay, like I said, once in a while they'll lay a couple eggs on them. But yeah, they, Still and, and you know, three to 500 is probably m more. I mean, there have been numbers that have been higher, um, especially in captivity. Um, I know that when I do a captive mating, um, it within three days I can have 300 eggs which is a lot of caterpillars to take care of <laughs> a lot of caterpillar frass to get yeah. rid of <laughs> so but you know like I said I've, I've really scaled it down because it's a full-time job and the year that my the bacteria hit my cages I went from five hours a day to ten hours a day just maintaining my bugs um, and it was horrible it was just so depressing so I learned my lesson and now I you know I, I keep around caterpillars so I have them for lectures and stuff 
Um, and I do like releasing them onto my property because they stay on my property and I still have lots of monarchs, you know. Um, and I do have so much milkweed and I think that in that sense I'm doing good. Um, but like I said, and, and people really highly frown upon the monarch releases for like weddings. If you want to raise painted ladies, did you say you raised painted? You said you raised um, Release painted ladies <laughs> because they're not as vulnerable. Um, what happens with the monarchs is that, and this is what we do at the lab in order to have enough monarchs for tagging at the monarch festival in the fall in Minneapolis, is that once we you start getting to a point where you're getting close to the festival and you've got to main you've got to hold uh, butterflies they go into a little glassine envelope and then they go into the fridge where they're cooled down so they won't mature any farther and then they take them out like once a week and force feed them and put them back in the envelope and put them back in the refrigerator and this is how we maintain them until we're ready to release now I have to cut the lab a little slack. They are, after all, a research lab. Um, but I don't have to cut any slack to people who raise monarchs for wedding releases. Because if you're having to do this in order to maintain enough for a release, um, I just don't think that's right. That's my own personal opinion. Wow. Is the monarch lab, the one you're talking with the university, are they the ones that have the monarch um, display at the state fair because they're doing it. They have like you know, the little plastic, you know, the little wrappers and everything. And there's just thousands of them. I, they, I, I, they're, they're tied in somehow, but I don't think they actually run that booth. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, butterfly breeders around the country that um, do actually do good by raising butterflies for different types of butterfly museums or you know things like that um, and these people the one thing is that they they really regulate themselves because it's going to do them injustice if they're shipping off a crate of dead caterpillars or infected bugs so some of the some of these organizations are really very good at what they do and really police themselves and that's a different story than somebody who's just saying hey i'm going to make a few bucks raising monarchs for weddings yeah, so this was, a, this was, it was but that yeah I, i'm familiar research. Yeah, I, yeah. Know, I know that they said that they were involved in the research and stuff. And, and they, the Monarch Lab is a pretty impressive place and they have a great website. Um, they do a lot of work with teaching um, teachers with schools and working with schools. And again, a lot of links on my website, so check that kind of stuff out. So. Yay. Oh, yay! <laughs>